Okay, um, uh, a couple updates as I'm getting getting ready for this, getting my computer going. Um, so we're not quite done grading project two. Uh, we got through all of the hard stuff, like reading all of your descriptions and everything, um, and and grading that part. I think we gave pretty much everyone full credit. Um, so I just need over the next week or so, I'm gonna make actual input and then run all of your different implementations against them. Um, and we'll basically just more or less like algable how, how that, that ranking is, but less complicated and uh, I don't have time to implement anything too too fancy. Um, so that is that is that'll be coming soon. Um, let me think. Is there any other? Oh yeah. So the there's a homework due this this Friday. I think is when I had it due. Um, let's see. Where is the schedule? And then I also, um, yeah, so homework three is due at the end of, homework four is due at the end of the week. And um, I realized that, so our, our the finals on the seventh, so it, it's, it's the week of May 3rd on the Friday. So, I'm going to move project three, since that's all going to be auto graded. I'll make that do finals week instead of the, the day of the final, because that seems kind of bad. Um, <laughs> Hunger game style, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, anyway, so project three, I'm gonna make that do probably Wednesday or Friday of finals week. Um, so any, any questions on that? Final take home or during the allotted time? It's gonna be during the allotted time, which is Friday from seven to nine. Oh, and about that, so, it's, I'm going to administer it in person, but if you're, um, if for, if like at the beginning of the semester you said you're taking it this class remotely and like 100% remote, um, please let me know if you haven't already, just so that I know who's taking it, going to be taking this remote. Also, if you have some other reason for not coming in person, to take the exam, whether that's you're under quarantine or, you know, just just email me. Maybe you know you have a medical issue or or something. You can just email me. I'll, I'll pretty much have a no questions asked policy as long as you're um, emailing me. Otherwise, the people who are doing it uh, take home or doing it remotely uh, will have the same amount of time. So it'll be during that same same block unless you have a scheduling conflict, in which case, again, talk to me. Um, so, you know, I'll release the, the PDF at seven and then you'll have until nine to submit. I, I'll give you like 10 or so minutes at the end just to, to make sure you have your, all of the, the scanning done and everything. Um, so I, I'm gonna to have to figure out if I'm gonna make this whole thing open notes or not. Um, so you will be proctored. The people who are taking it remotely will be proctored um, by Adam. So you'll have Zoom on and you'll need your camera on. Um, but I haven't decided if I'm gonna make it open notes or not. Probably not, but we'll, we'll kind of see. Um, yeah, any other questions?
No, let me actually, before I forget, take a note. Like, uh, I guess to some extent, um, it, so if it's open node, it's gonna be harder, like significantly harder. If it's not, then it's probably gonna be easier. So th there is, it, and it will be cumulative deaths. So there's that. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of figure that out. So, Where can we review the content covered in homework four? Homework four. Which one is this? So this is um, virtual and physical addresses and the TLB, so virtual memory slides. And whichever lectures those were, I I, I don't remember which lectures <laughs> covered which topics. So you'll have to go kind of find those. Okay. I think that's about it. So um, we finished last we talking about these asymmetric chip multiprocessors or ACMP for short, asymmetric chip multiprocessor. So let's remind ourselves of why we want this uh, at all. So the, the main reason is that we don't, you know, if we just have a bunch of large cores, that's going to limit our ability to take advantage of the parallel nature of our code. And if we have a bunch of small cores, uh, any single core part of our code, any single threaded part of our code is gonna be really slow. So the idea is to kind of mix things up and have some large, some small, and uh, you know, there, there's, uh, th these large cores are not only just physically large, they also have more features. You know, this might have, um, let's see here, Did we have a, where was the comparison? You know, it might have a, out of order execution and it might have bigger pipeline, better cache, stuff like this, whereas a small core is gonna be, uh, have less, less features maybe it doesn't have as, as fancy of a branch predictor or um, this doesn't have out of order execution. So we're going to have some of each and this is going to allow us, sorry, to have more flexibility. What we'll do is we can run, if we need to run th things in parallel, we can put stuff on all the different small cores and on the large core. If we need to run something really fast sequentially, we can just put it on a large core. Um, and so we, we did a bit of comparison of, of just a hypothetical situation where, why are my arrows just, this thing, I don't know, do I need new batteries in this? I don't know. I guess this is what happens when you, use it for a semester, whatever. Uh, anyway, we ended here, I think, where we were looking at the difference between uh, choosing a bunch of large cores, choosing a bunch of small cores, or um, this asymmetric one where we have one large and then a bunch of small ones. And we noticed that because we have one large core in each one of these, our serial performance, meaning one, one thread is going to be this, this two in each of these cases, because there's only one thread. If, if we were over here, only this one large core would be utilized. Over here in our ACMP processor, we're um, 
also just utilizing this one core, but we get this speed up from all the fancy features that we implemented on the large core. The disadvantage to the large cores is in parallel throughput. Each large core can do a parallel part of the code twice as fast as a small core could. So that's this two times two, but there's only four of them, meaning we get a total of eight, eight parallel units uh, effectively uh, of throughput. If we do a bunch of small cores, we're gonna get 16. So we get twice as much throughput with these smaller cores because our performance, even though the, it's four times as large, our performance is not four times as great. It's only two times larger. So um, that's where we get the 16 and kind of the best of both, both worlds is being able to do parallel code on our 12 small cores and then put two of the parallel units of work on the large core. So uh, this is the idea, right? We, we're able to really allocate our workload to the cores that are best suited to that part of the workload. Um, we also modified Amdahl's law to account for this. So, um, F is our parallelizable fraction, L is the number of large processors, and then X is the speed up of a large processor over a smaller one. So our speed up um, is going to be the, the one minus F, the non-parallelizable -parallel portion over X, which is that speed up that we get from the large core, the fancy, more featureful core. And then over here, the, the fraction of the code that is parallelizable divided by S, which is the number of small processors. plus x times l, because we're able to um, speed up these. Uh, th this is a, basically accounting for the speed up and the ability that the large core has to run multiple of our parallel work units um, in the same amount of time as a small core takes to, to do just one. OK. Any questions, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about these these parallel bottlenecks. So, um, serial code is always what we want to get rid of. Serial code is annoying because we can't parallelize it and put it up on a bunch of cores. Our utilization is very low in this situation if we have serial code. Um, now, even in parallel code though, you can have some serial bits to it. Um, you can kind of have situations where critical sections are contended. So what does this mean? Let's just say we're all, we're trying to write a sum and we're doing this a parallel sum. And at the end of our sum, we do our we do our sum over our subset of the problem, and then we have to uh, add that into our accumulator variable. Well, it would be really bad if all of our processors tried to update that accumulator value at the same time. You're going to get race conditions. You don't know who wins. So that's what a that critical section is going to be contentious. If all of our threads end at the same time, well they're gonna to have to wait for each other to lock and unlock that shared resource. Um, additionally, another issue that we're gonna run into is that different bits of the problem uh, are gonna take different amounts of time. So say we're doing a more complicated thing than a sum or even, even just a sum, right? Where we have um, one processor may get a thousand elements, the other one may only get uh, 900, for example, just because of the array size or something like this. 
in those sorts of situations, the parallel stages on the different processors are going to take shorter or longer amounts of time, depending um, on which one they are, are, are on. And the idea here is let's just try and identify which code portions cause serialization and then send those to the larger core. So let's get rid of that latency. Let's reduce that latency at least uh, with that, that speedier core. Um, and we can, this helps with a few things that it'll kind of help us stagger critical sections. And if one stage just happens to be more compute intensive than other stages, um, in this parallel code, we can we can put that on the larger core so it can be optimized. Okay, so we're not gonna talk through the entirety of this, um, but I, I do want to at least introduce this topic and, and give you an idea of how uh, of what this means. So let's just look at this program execution. All right, so we have red, which is our critical section, uh, gray, which is our parallel section. So the critical section, only one thread can be in the critical section at once, uh, whereas the parallel section, multiple processors can be in the parallel part of the code at once. So let's look at, um, kind of 12 iterations. So we're, we're doing this program or this loop, which has a, a sequential critical section, and then it has some parallel, uh, parallel code. And we're doing this 12 times in a row. So if we have just one core, we have to do it, you know, one at, one at a time, one, two, three, et cetera, all the way down to 12. So this is what we would have to do if we just have one core. If we only have one processor, we're going to spend exactly 33% of our time doing the critical section, and then the other 33% doing this parallel part, but we only have one core, so um, you know, we're only going to, uh, we aren't going to see any parallel speed up, obviously. Now, let's look at what happens when we get two processors. If we have two processors, we still have to make sure that the critical sections are like we never enter the critical section um, at the same time as another program, but we can do our parallel second sections at the same time. So you can see here and over here, and you know every uh, here and here um, that we're doing um, two parallel sections at once. But because of the critical section, we have to do a bit of staggering where we do the critical section on this first thread, then the second thread, then we do some parallel stuff, but then we have to go back to a critical section where you do that on the first thread and the second thread, et cetera. But it's still a pretty darn good speed up, right? It's almost times two. Right? It's just a little bit more than six here, which is half, almost half of that 12. So it might be natural to think, oh, if we increase the core count again from two to three, well, we're gonna see a three times speed up from, from 12. So we would see like uh, uh, four, but that's not quite the case. We're, we're starting to lose speed up um, due to the fact that we have these critical sections that are causing contention. All right. This is the this is the fundamental problem. Our critical sections have to be done at different times. It, no two threads can be in the same critical section at once. Now, it gets even worse. So you know we might be like, okay, P three. You know we only got this much performance gain, but that that was a pretty significant amount. Let's just go ahead and pump that up to four cores now. And so even if we do see some diminishing returns, we'll at least get some return. Well, unfortunately for you, if you do that, um, you get no return. Why? Well, it's because of this darn critical section. 
we have to do the critical section before we can do the parallel section. So what ends up happening is even though we've distributed it across a bunch, uh, an, an additional core, we actually can't start doing the next iteration. We can't start doing the next critical section because there's another core that's in the critical section at that same time. So we've ended up in a situation where we can't optimize any further because the critical section is just too big. We've hit the limit of what uh, parallelism can do under this implementation. Do all those parallelizable sections have to run for that length? Wouldn't it be better to start at the same time with the parallelizable section staggering at the beginning to save more time? So I'm not sure what you mean by the parallel sections, parallelizable sections stagger. Mm, excuse me. Like we, could, we, we can't, for example, put the, this before, if that's what you're asking. We always have to do the red before the gray. Yeah, so so I think that might be the 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 confusion there. So yeah, that's a great question though. So basically, think of it like this: our critical section is maybe um, fetching the work that we have to do. So it's fetching, hey, which part of the array should I process? And then the the um, uh, gray stuff has to go, you know, and and process that actual stuff. Does the whole piece of one segment need to be on one processor? We're going to go with yes for now. And, and again, it kind of goes back to my, my play toy example, right? If this red section here is going and fetching the work that we need to do, say it's, this involves going and um, figuring out which section of the array to process. It involves pulling it from memory, stuff like that. I, I, you know, stuff, uh, then the gray stuff has to be on that same core because that's where the data is now. Yeah, red has to happen first, and then we can do the gray stuff. Yeah, this is, yes, that's correct. So, um, yeah, any other questions before we, we move on? I don't want to confuse anybody right off the bat. So, what can we do? Well, let's try and target this red critical section for some optimization. So, oh, I guess I guess my little this kind of in the this yellow thing's kind of in the way, isn't it? Oh well. So let's just say that we accelerate our critical section by two. Um, so, so now it's twice as fast and we get some decent performance increase a little bit here on, uh, on the single core. Um, but what we're also going to see is that every step of the way, we're going to also see some improvement. So before, um, we were sort of limited to, to here with our parallelism for um, uh, P equals two. Now we're, we're gaining a little bit more. Again, just because we sped up our critical section, this blue portion. Ignore P3, but look at P4. Notice that because our critical section isn't as large anymore, we're able to sort of stagger this more effectively. And we don't have this contention over our critical section, because now the the critical section is uh, half as half as long, which means you know until our critical section kind of you know we could probably go one more core and still get a uh, get a bit of performance gain, but after that then we would again need to optimize the critical section to get any more performance gain.
So back to Emilio's question, I guess it's, it, it, it'll, it depends on your workload, but sometimes you can also uh, offload that critical section onto a larger core. It, like I said, it, it really depends on the nature of it. If it's data intensive, you know, a lot of memory accesses or something, um, that's probably not as easy, but uh, I apologize for, for misspeaking earlier, but you, for, for some situations, especially if it's compute intensive or something, you can just offload that onto a larger core and do it there. So what we saw in the, pa in the previous slide then was, let's just say we have this blue section here. Let's go ahead and offload that onto a, a big core, do it there, and then send back that work to the smaller parallel core. And that's going to allow us to continue to see this optimization. So let's see here. What is the benefit here? Well, we're, we're reducing serialization. So we're reducing that um, sort of blockade of that critical section by offloading the, that onto our larger core. What we're also doing is um, kind of hiding the fact that we have this problem, right? Uh, the problem is fundamentally we have this critical section. So let's just try and make it super fast. So it kind of goes, goes away, even though it's still there, we'll try and minimize its ability to affect our performance uh, gains or lack thereof. And another thing, if, if, you, if you are able to do this is kind of a, in tandem between your hardware and software, um, then your pro the programmer isn't going to need to do as much to actually optimize the parallel code. All you have to do is say, hey, this part's uh, sequential, this part's parallel, go ahead and do this on a big core, do this one on a small core, and call it a day. And in reality, this is kind of what often does happen. Um, a, a good example is like um, with GPUs, right? Where we do a lot of compute intensive things on our CPU, then allow it to go over to the GPU and then let it do all of its parallel work and then come back to the CPU, we do some more data mashing, send it back to the GPU, et cetera. Okay. Any questions? Let me see, did I wanna cover this? No, I don't, okay. We're gonna stop there then. And move on. here. I didn't actually modify anything. I'll remove that. <laughs> okay. So let's talk and switch gears about uh, to, um, we're still going to be talking about multiprocessors, but now we're going to be talking in the context of sort of the memory operations that each core, each thread on each core is doing. So Memory ordering is really the key here. Um, and let's talk about what this actually means. You did modify it. That was <laughs> yeah, I modified the, the title slide. I changed it from lecture 13 to 14. Um, okay, so, so let's talk about ordering of operations. Let's just say that we have operations A, 
B, C, and D. And then the question is, what order should the hardware execute and report the results of these operations? Um, kind of your intuition would say if you, if you did A first and B and C then D that they that it would report these results in that order. Um, so if you're a single threaded application, this is probably what you expect, right? And there's there's kind of this contract between you, the programmer, and the micro architect that is specified by the ISA, right? The ISA is going to be like, yeah, if you load something and then read it, it'll, you know, if you load something here and load something here, those will, and then, you know, right here and then right there, those will happen in that order that you specified in your code. So why is this useful? Well, it's really useful because, you know, if you if you don't have guarantees about the order, you're going to have a terrible time debugging. You know, you're going to have to do a bunch of error handling yourself to recover state from, you know, mis misordered operations and such. Exception handling is going to be a total nightmare as well. So, like we've seen with out of order execution, like we've seen with caching as well, um, and kind of all of the optimizations that we've discussed, branch prediction, all of these require that you maintain that contract with the programmer. You know, things are going to appear like they happened in order, for example. Memory operations are going to appear as if they happened in order. So if preserving this expected or agreed upon, you know, contractually by the ISA, if that preservation is nice for the programmer, it's terrible for us as architects now to figure out how to, to, uh, to actually implement this. We've already seen this with out of order execution, right? We have to have this reorder buffer or this, uh, um, history buffers so that we can restore after an exception, stuff like that. It's just terrible. Nobody likes it um, from an architecture standpoint. And we've also seen this with branch prediction as well, which is, you know, to, to maintain the illusion that things are happening one after another, we have to do stuff like pipeline flushes and it's just all a mess for the hardware designer. So this is the challenge. We have to maintain the ordering of operations abstraction, but we also want to make things fast. So this is going to be the challenge that we that we that we tackle. Oh, and by the way, it's going to be even harder because now we have multiple cores that we have to deal with. If you just have one core, it's not too big of a deal, but what if Operation A happens on processor one, and operation C is happening on processor two. What are you going to do? There we go. Okay. Sorry, the slide didn't advance for a second there. So, in a single processor, the uh, ordering of memory operations is dictated in pretty much every single computer that you ever would look at by this, the von Neumann model. Uh, and that basically just says that it happens in sequence. The hardware is just going to execute the load and store operations in the exact order that is specified by the sequential program. Um, this is what we're all used to, hopefully. And I mean, uh, it's pretty easy to reason about as well, right? You, you know that this load is gonna be happening before that load or something. Out of order execution, 
um, doesn't affect this, um, at least semantically. It may, it may, with out of order execution, you may be loading things at different times. But as, as we saw, um, the retiring or the reporting of, of the results um, of these load and store operations is in the same order as specified in our sequential program. That's why we need a reorder bus. So what are the advantages to this? Well, obviously the biggest one is that we have precision in execution state. Um, it's easy to, well, easy. E it's relatively easy to reason about the state of the processor if we have these guarantees about sequential order of memory operation. And if it's easier to reason about, it's also easier to debug. So, you know, programmers are happy. Um, oh, and also um, in these situations, since it's in, a, it's in the same order, we're, we're guaranteed that everything is being retired um, and, and reported to our hardware the same order, we're guaranteed that the state at any given point, if we run the same exact program with the same exact input, will be the same uh, every single time we run the program. We don't have any uh, problems with, with non-determinism there. Now, the disadvantage is that we are going to have ordering overhead, right? That reorder buffer, again, and just coming back to bite us, this is another cycle that we have to wait uh, before we can, can send things into our registers. Um, it's going to uh, increase the complexity, for example, because now we got to do more bypassing. We have to have this reorder buffer, all sorts of things like that. And, you know, um, all this is going to reduce our performance as well. Now, Let's talk about the ordering of memory operations when we have multiple processors. So with single processors, it's easy, right? You always know which instructions will be executed, you know, if you have good branch prediction and such, or if you're the programmer and just know intuitively. Um, but with the multiple processors, we have additional challenges. So the first part to, to this is that on a given processor, each memory operation is going to be in sequential ordering with respect to that thread that is running on the processor. So another way of saying this is that each individual processor is going to obey the von Neumann model. So if you're on thread A and you do operation one, then two, then three, that is how it will be reported to that processor. And if you're over here on processor um, two or whatever, then you're doing memory operation three, four, and, or five, six, and seven, you'll see those committed to hardware in that order. However, there is a bit of a challenge, and that is that both or all of the processors are going to be doing the same mem or going to be doing their memory operation at the same time. So we're going to be doing a bunch of concurrent memory accesses. So that request one from processor one could be happening at the same time as, uh, you know, request five on processor two. So the, the pro, another problem is that we're in a shared memory system. So if we're doing these memory operations concurrently to one another, we're going to have to have um, uh, some guarantees about how, how that memory, that shared memory is going to behave. So 
another way of thinking about this is how do each how does each processor see the memory operations from all the other processors? Um, we have to figure out an ordering for that. We have to figure out an ordering for cross-processor memory operations. So why does this matter? Um, one of the big things that we, we care about is being able to, de to debug code because unfortunately we aren't perfect and well I am but um, so I never make any bugs so I, I don't know what this is like but uh, I hear from from friends that that bugs are annoying to debug so uh, not that I have any experience with this but uh, they tell me that it's good to be able to repeat and run the program multiple times to figure out where they made an error. Like I said, I have no clue what that's like. Um, so this is going to be one of the one of the keys that we want to preserve. We want to preserve um, some semblance of repeatability, so we don't have just like totally arbitrary um, things happening in our program due to multiple cores doing different memory operations at different times. Another thing is correctness. So um, we can actually have uh, a situation where our memory operations is are different from the point of view of the two different processors. And we'll see an example of that in just a minute. We're going to see that correctness is going to be uh, 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 of our program is going to be kind of called into question if we don't have the right hardware support for the, the various concurrency primitives that are required. Um, now, again, whenever we add some new fancy thing to our processors, it's going to make our lives harder. Um, having this, so this is a new feature because now we're in a multi-core situation. We have to coordinate and make sure that our um, ordering of memory operations is, is sequential across all of our different cores. Okay, so. That's why we have to have class on this is because no, it's hard. So let's look at an example um, where order affects correctness. All right. So this this is this is the goal. Why could the order of memory operations actually affect the correctness of our program? And the best example of this is when we're sharing, when we're trying to protect shared data. So let's remember back to the beginning of this lecture when we, were, when we talked about the critical section. That critical section of code is kind of this protected area. No two threads can be at it, in it at the same time. So we have to guarantee that um, if thread A is in it, then thread B is not in that critical section. So go ahead and just, what, what, do you, what would you do immediately just if you were trying to be naive about this um, without using any hardware primitives that you may know about? What would be your initial thought of how to solve this problem? So locking, but like, Let's just say that you forgot that locks existed. What would you try? Maybe this is something you, if you started programming, like I started programming when I was pretty young, so I did this a few times. It's not a good solution, but it's kind of like locking, but more stupid. 
What if you just have like a, a global variable and you just set it as like, hey, I'm in the critical section. Let's, let's ignore semaphores and, and locks because those are too complicated for, for me. So let's, let's just go with something simple uh, like, um, oh, well, why is my, there we go. Like, let's just say that we went with, uh, with some variables. We just uh, had this uh, variable f1, which says we're going to set it to one. And then, you know, if it's one, then it means that we're in our critical section. And then we guarantee over here with this f1 equals zero. Um, you know, if, if this f1 is, is equal to one, then this won't enter the critical section. We'll go and do something else. So we're going to see this is problematic and the reason is well we we don't really have any guarantees about uh, whether or not um, you know this this load or this store is going to be reported to the hardware first and which on you know per thread right because these are happening on two different threads they're updating the same shared memory but we don't have any guarantees about when each of these if statements is going to be executed so this leads to a race condition. So let's go back. And now we'll talk a little bit about what Jason and Amelia mentioned, which is that we need some primitives. Uh, we are not allowed to update shared data concurrently. So if we are, then we're gonna have major correctness problems. You're gonna have race conditions. You won't be able to, de to debug. It'll just be terrible. Um, so let's encapsulate our critical sections with some synchronization constructs. The, the primary ones are locks and semaphores that um, both Jason and Amelia mentioned. Um, By the way, even, even um, in sort of interpreted languages or CL common language sort of JVM or common language runtime languages, those still need a hardware implementation of, of these locking um, uh, constructs because fundamentally at some point they're gonna have to have a shared bit of memory, even if it's just a very small amount to, to, to tell the interpreter what to do. Um, so just, just an aside there. Um, and yeah, as I've said before, only one thread can be executing a critical section at a given time. So we have to provide the synchronization primitives to the programmer so that the programmer can protect that shared data. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this example here, but but this is this is not going to do the trick. If the programmer does this, it's it's not going to work um, because of the fact that this is uh, we we don't have as strong guarantees cross threads. So how do we support this? What do we need to provide? Um, first of all, the programmer needs to do it correctly. The programmer needs to handle the mutual exclusion synchronization stuff on their own end. Like they have to basically mark things as this is the critical section. No two threads can be in this part of the code at once. So we're just gonna assume as architects that the programmer knows what they're doing. And they've done this. We can't really assume anything else. Um, and we just have to rely on programmers to do this correctly. But um, you know, 
and this is hard. So programmers are gonna screw it up and that's, you know, whatever. But we have to make sure that the underlying primitives that the hardware provides um, to the programmer are reliable. So if you wanna know more about sort of kind of the, the software side of things, this is a good paper. You can also just take any parallel programming class as well. And, um, or you can just try to write a parallel program yourself and realize that it's hard. <laughs> but assuming that we have a correct implementation of the software side of things. Um, that software implementation is going to rely on, on a few hardware primitives, namely some primitives that allow for correct synchronization. Um, if the hardware primitives aren't correct or flaky or something like that, then it, all bets are off. Like if your lock or your semaphore isn't reliable, I mean, there's no way that you can debug your program. It, it just won't work. Um, there will be non-determinism introduced into your system. So we have to guarantee that the hardware implementation of these primitives is in fact correct. And um, if they are correct, then at least, um, it'll be easy to reason about them like individually. As a whole, it'll be just very, very difficult still. So pro parallel programming is hard, but at least you'll have a reliable base to work off of. Um, so let's go and look at why we need, let's look at another example of why we need these primitives. And that involves this bit of code. I'll zoom in here, it's a bit small. Okay, so we have two processors, P1, P2. Um, and the way that this is gonna work, or we're gonna try to make it work, is that um, F1, this variable basically is, a, is indicating whether or not we are in the critical section in processor one, and F2 is going to indicate whether or not we're in the critical section for P2. Okay, so then we do a bunch of code and then later on A happens. So this is the first memory operation. This is going to be a store operation. We're storing value one into F1. So now we've updated F1. which basically is gonna say, hey, we've entered the critical section on P1. So then we go on and we check F2. So where is F2? Well, F2 is gating the critical section on this processor over here, P1. So it's initially set to zero, and then we set it to one right before we enter the critical section. So, Let's just imagine for a moment that all memory operations are instant and that they propagate to all of the cores at once. Okay, this is an unrealistic expectation, but let's just go with it. Um, are, we, are we gonna be okay in that situation? Are we going to be able to do this, have it propagate immediately over here to make sure that if this you know, that we don't enter the if statement um, for the critical section. Are we guaranteed that that's gonna be, if we, if we have instant memory, are we gonna be okay? Yes or no? Yes, okay. We have one vote for yes. All right, one out of 
How many people are here? 36. Oh, but like three of these are me, so. Okay. What a, so let's think about what's involved in this if statement though. This actually gets compiled as a few instructions. There's a load and then there's a comparison. So does that, does that change your mind about whether or not this will be correct? We have instant memory. But notice that I said memory, not registers. So, so let, let's just kind of think about how this would compile, right? It would be a load into some register. So we load memory address F of F1 into some register. And then the next instruction is a um, comparison against zero. It's a branch not equal zero. You know, it'll it'll move, go down here if it's if it's not equal to zero. So, if in that intervening time between the load and our actual execution of the uh, conditional, if in that intervening time this process over here set f one, we're gonna we're gonna still have an incorrect implementation. So it's actually pretty bad, right? Um, even with instantaneous memory. And yeah, technically, I, yeah, both could be, could be locked out as well. You could end up with deadlock. It just depends on which order and kind of the timing between the two threads. So again, it's just another race condition. You know, we've kind of, we, we tried to eliminate a race condition by introducing a new one. So that was successful. Um, so let's continue talking about the, the operation of this code a little bit more though. Um, we're checking F2 over here to make sure that we haven't entered the critical section. Um, and that way then, you know, again. Oh, and by the way, also, even if we had instantaneous like propagation of, of memory changes, even into the register, we probably still wouldn't be fine because guess what? It's a pipeline. So you're gonna have out of order execution and bypassing. So you are still going to potentially be using the wrong values in memory uh, in, your, in your pipeline. So um, hopefully I'm kind of getting you to the point where you're like, okay, we, we really need these primitives. Um, and then after we exit the critical section, then we're trying to just go ahead. Oh, hey, let's just set it equal to one or something. So, or um, uh, to, I think this should be equal zero. I don't know. Um, go ahead and, and say, hey, let's, let's reset it. We're no longer in the critical section. All right, so let's keep these, these memory operations in, in mind as we look through the next example as well. Any questions, by the way, before we continue? Should line C say F1 equals zero? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a typo or not a typo since it's written, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to set it to not equal to zero we would want to set it equal to zero so that then we could we could enter in the critical section on p1 but again like i said this all just doesn't work because of no guarantees about memory operations across threads or okay so yeah the, the key is that each processor could end up in the same critical section, in this critical section, by totally obeying all of the rules of the von Neumann model for a single processor. Because remember, the von Neumann model doesn't say anything about the, the cross-processor stuff. It only says stuff about 
the individual processors and the memory operations going sequentially within that. So let's see how this would work. First of all, just a, just kind of a picture to in your mind to kind of be thinking about how this is working. You have your processors that kind of have this interconnection network. This is a communication bus between processors to tell so that they can tell each other what they're doing. Um, and then that is also kind of how they'll get memory. Everything kind of goes through this bus more or less. Okay, so let's, you know, we've, we've kind of talked through how this could introduce an incorrect result, but this is going to be a bit better, more in depth illustration of exactly how. So we have P1 and we have P2. We have our interconnection network, and this is our um, two different memory locations, F1 and F2. So if we go back up here, F1 tells us whether or not we're in the critical section for P1, and F2 tells us whether or not we're in the critical section for P2. So let's consider time zero. P1 is going to execute A. So let's go back up here. P1 is executing F1 equals one. And also at time zero, P2 executes X. So it's also setting F2 equals one. Now, um, this set, this set, you know, this, um, uh, store operation effectively is going to be sent to memory, but it's going to take a little while because unfortunately we don't have instantaneous memory. If we did, it would be a little bit easier. Um, but uh, to our P1, it's just going to assume that this has already happened because uh, the abstraction to the programmer at the ISA level is that when you do a store, it is instant. You know, th there's no, um, th there's not really a way to know when exactly that bit of memory actually hits your RAM, for example. Well, there is if you flush, if you like explicitly flush, but you know, but then everything's bad and and really slow. So, um, you know, from the from P one's perspective, though, F one is going to be equal to one, and you can kind of think of this also in terms of P one's cache. It had to load in this value into a cache, and then it it wrote it to the cache. So now it thinks that P one is uh, or F one, sorry, is equal to one. If you try and load it again, it'll it'll give you that one as a result. Same thing with P2 um, with relation to F2. So at time zero, what we see is that one of the processors thinks that F1 equals one. Uh, and the other processor thinks that F2 equals one but they haven't shared that information with one another because there's some latency of this operation actually hitting memory. Okay. So now let's talk about time one. So at time one, P1 is going to execute B. So that's our test. That's our conditional, seeing that it is F2 equal to zero. So 
this involves doing a load operation. So we're loading F2, um, and this is where we, we, we start, start this operation. Now, loads are a bit different than stores. Stores should look instantaneous to the programmer. Loads, you know, we're gonna have to stall a little while before we actually get that load result back. But, um, that's fine. We can just stall our pipeline for a little while. And anyway, at this point, this, this load instruction is sent to memory. So we send it, hey, I need this, this F2 value. Meanwhile, over on P2, we're doing the same thing, except for, for F1. So let's go, I'll scroll back up here just so we're very clear about, we've executed sequentially on both cores, right? We've done A, then B, we've done X, then Y. We did this memory operation, then this memory operation. You know, we did A and then B. We also did X and then Y. But um, we're still gonna have problems. So we did this load um, and we sent that request to memory. It takes 50 cycles or 49 cycles or whatever to um, uh, um, uh, to, to complete that memory operation. So, you know, pretty reasonable time if it's not in cache, for example. Um, and it gives P1 that F2 is zero. So we've completed our load of F2. Why does it do this? Well, it's because this store F2, even though it looks complete from the perspective of P2, isn't actually complete. We're gonna see it actually completes down here after we've done our checks. Now it's gonna, it's down at time 100 even. So it's like really slow. Additionally, on the other side on P2, we have the same issue. Um, F1 is going to be loaded in and it's going to be zero. Um, and so now what happens? What's happened? Well, first of all, P1 sees the state of the world as being that F1 equals one and F2 equals zero, which is a necessary condition for going into its critical section, by the way. Uh, additionally, though, P2 sees F2 is 1, and F1 is 0. So it actually sees a different view of the world, um, even though they've, they've still followed all of the, the rules for the von Neumann architecture. Why does the write end up being slower than the read? Great question. Um, could be a multitude of reasons. Could just be scheduling. Could be that maybe F2 was in, maybe the read was already in cache. Um, could be that, uh, you know, we just have a really bad write hardware that just is slower. You know, th there's a variety of reasons. Um, but, you know, th the key is that even if it, you know, for example, even if it takes a long time to do a write, if we're just doing a single core, it's going to be all fine. Nothing's going to be a problem. It's only when we introduce the second core that the things get problematic. So anyway, um, we've done this load. We see two different states of the world. Both states happen to be states where we can just go ahead and enter the critical section. So both of these programs are actually going to get into our critical section at the same time. Eventually though, the write's gonna happen and now it looks like F1 is one and F2 is one. So these finally actually arrive and get committed into memory. Um, even though the processor thought that up here, it was, it was set. Okay, so this was kind of a lot. Any questions? And then we'll we'll move on.
so the key is that the two the, the views of the world from these two different processors were different on processor one it looked like a happened then b happened and then x happened way later right over here we can just go and see this it looks this store this memory operation a looks like it's done then we do b and then uh this x operation x is this setting of f1 to one um that is is done at uh, at time 100 so it's done after a and b on the other side it's x y and then a so on one processor it looks like a happened before x on the other it looks like x happened before a obviously this has caused a problem because we managed to get to the same critical section at the same time um so we're gonna we're gonna have to solve this problem uh one way that we can solve it is to introduce sequential consistency so this is that all processors see the exact same order of operations to memory um all of our memory operations happen in an order and it's consistent across all of our processors and this is going to be a global total order right we're, we're guaranteed that that within this global order sounds like a real apocalyptic thing to say whatever um each processor's operation is going to look sequential with respect to its own operations but it's also going to be interleaved with potentially other processors operations so this would be if we had a, a strong global order um, so the, the 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 main paper on this is is listed here and the idea is that we we have consistency we have sequential consistency in a multiprocessor system if uh the result of the execution is the same um uh as if the operations on all the processors were executed in uh, some sequential order and we also have to have that each individual processor has their memory operations appear in the sequence justified by the program so these are the two conditions that um, are required for sequential consistency okay that is it for today we'll pick this up next lecture and i'll stick around for any last questions and i'll be at office hours